This is a simulation meant to demonstrate the rapid changes brought about by industrialization in its birthplace, Great Britain of the late 18th century. This video accompanies the paper handout featuring a map of a region intended to represent pockets of England, which first underwent industrial development, incorporating the connection between rural agricultural areas, growing cities and thriving coastal ports. This simulation takes place in a series of phases. Each phase will involve a brief narration of the historical events taking place and then will prompt the player to alter or add to their map. The prompt will include a visual key showing how to draw each edition being placed. Don't worry, you're not expected to create an artistic masterpiece. In order to complete this simulation, you'll need the map, scissors, some scrap paper, ideally already cut up into smaller pieces, a glue stick or tape, and a pencil. As the phases progress, you can make use of your supplies to add to and alter the map as needed. At times, you might feel the need to clear a forest or level an area for development, for which you will need to quickly cut out scrap paper in the size and shape needed and glue it to the map. And voila, you've got more space to build. As the city expands, you'll need to decide where to add new streets for further development. Each phase's construction prompt will have a timer, so you'll have to move quickly to make an alteration or additions. Carefully consider your placement early on, as several phases down the road, you might wish you'd utilize the given space more efficiently. Good luck! The year is 1770, in Great Britain, under the reign of His Royal Majesty King George III. The mighty British Empire has endeavoured to establish a wide network of colonial territories across the globe. It is a time of great ambition and the prospect of brilliant prosperity as Great Britain seeks more in the way of lucrative commerce. But in many parts of the British Isles, a slow and steady life continues in much the same as it did centuries before. That is certainly true here, in this quiet hamlet. It isn't much more than a small collection of cottages with a surrounding patchwork of agricultural land. Like elsewhere across our realm, families tend to their lands or lands they lease and work diligently to produce bountiful harvests. In recent years, advancements such as the seed drill and improved crop rotation have resulted in a greater surplus of food, which naturally has led to a growing population. Still, these villagers' lives are quite simple and revolve around an age-old seasonal routine. Here, you see a few simple cottages, farm fields, pastures for grazing, and a few barns and silos. A short distance away, along a road originally built by the Romans, we find an average English city. Like many others, it acts as a regional hub for rural towns and villages on its periphery. Unlike life in our farm hamlet, Life for those who dwell here is a bit noisier, some would argue unbearably so. Here, you'll find busy, crowded streets and thoroughfares with carts and coaches rumbling along, and all manner of people going about their business. Craftsmen, shopkeepers, common labourers, university students and unruly street urchins, among others, hurrying along make for quite a sight. In recent years, a few factories along the river were constructed, housing the new water frame machines patented by Mr. Arkwright. These few machines are outdoing what a thousand women spinning cotton in their homes could do, though folks have complained that they're a bit of an eyesore taking up space on the riverbank. Here you see some family residences lining the avenues, some shops, some factories powered by the current of the river producing cotton textiles, an old cemetery, a church, a bank, a university, a tavern, a city hall, and a jail. And here we're at the port, one of many dotting the coasts of Great Britain. Connected to nearby towns via roadways and the river estuary, it has grown over the years much as the empire itself has. Just as Britain's activities abroad have grown in their reach and importance, so is the port in its roles of shipbuilding and storing wares for import and export. As Britain looks to expand and maintain its colonies the world over, ports such as these are increasingly vital and busy. Here you see several dockyards and warehouses. 
Just off the coast, one of our Royal Navy's many frigates and some merchantmen vessels returning from their long voyages carrying tea, pepper, cotton and the like. Industrial Phase 1, 1780 As the 1780s dawn, new opportunities are on the horizon. A few years ago, some engineers, among them the Scotsman James Watt, invented a powerful steam engine. This engine can drive very heavy machinery. It can run around the clock, fed by coal-fueled fires, and doesn't require proximity to a river. It can be built practically anywhere. Engineers begin building a few new textile factories, complete with a new Watt steam engine. Place two factories and an iron foundry in the city. Unlike older factories, this new variety have tall smokestacks, which belch dark smog over the city. Colour some black smoke leaving the smokestacks and smudge them with your thumb. Industrial Phase 2, 1800 As the years roll by, improvements on steam engines and the machines which they power are developing at an unbelievable pace. Entrepreneurs scramble to secure the capital to open new factories and source the raw materials they'll need to meet the demand for more and more finished goods. New banks open to finance these operations. The British East India Company is expanding its reach to supply British manufacturers with an ever-growing demand for raw goods. In the city, an increasing number of middle-class families seek to educate their male children. Increasingly, women are being hired to labour in the factories as well. Many of the lower-class families find it necessary that husband and wife both work to afford rent and put food on the table. Place three factories in the city four new shops, a private boys' school, a bank and two new merchantmen vessels in the waters near the port, along with a new warehouse. Industrial Phase 3, 1810 Improved iron foundries are opening thanks to the development of the so-called puddling process invented by Henry Court. Now, stronger wrought iron can be produced in much larger volumes. Meanwhile, new factories are opening and the wealthy industrialists building and running them are turning a tidy profit. They build exquisite homes in the city or sprawling country manors. Place two new factories, a bank, three new iron foundries and three lavish homes of the industrial upper class, built a distance away from the factories to avoid the smog and noise. Industrial Phase 4, 1820 As a hub of industrial production, the city is transforming before our eyes. More factories are going up and farm families are steadily moving into the city to meet the relentless demand for cheap, unskilled labour. As such, the city can't keep pace with the need for housing near the factories. Rows of hastily built tenements have gone up and families are living there in crowded, unsanitary conditions. These tenements are four and five storey structures, with entire families occupying single rooms together. The conditions are cramped and uncomfortable, but there is simply nowhere else to live. The neighbourhoods near the factories, called slums, aren't a pretty sight. The air is thick with smog and the stench of human waste as no proper sewage has been constructed. The blaring sound of machinery clanks and clacks day and night. 
Many of the workers are children, forced to work long hours and paid much less than adults. Some fear the factory conditions are doing them permanent physical and psychological damage. Rumours swirl of rising crime in busy parts of the city and outbreaks of disease in the overcrowded tenements. On a brighter note, pun intended, much progress has been made in the use of purified coal gas as a means to create street lamps, much more cheaply than the older kind using oil. The main avenues in many British cities are now aglow under the soft flickering of hundreds of lamps. Place in the city three factories, an iron foundry, a row of five tenements, a new jail, a new cemetery, and a new church. Line the main streets of the city with street lamps. Place in the port a new dockyard, a new warehouse, and two new merchantmen vessels. Industrial Phase 5, 1840 As industry continues to develop in the city, the demand for more coal soars. Thankfully, it has been discovered that the hills to the northwest are rich in coal deposits. As such, engineers have hurried to finish work on a canal, which will connect the new mining region to the river for easy transport. In addition, our region's first locomotive rail has been laid to connect the mines, factories and port. As the crowded city's workers are in need of a convenient place to relax, socialise and have a drink, public houses, otherwise called pubs, are popping up here and there. Place a mine in the hills. A canal connecting the mine region in the hills to the river. A railway running from the mine region through the city and connecting with the port. In the city, place two new factories, two rows of five tenements, a hospital and two pubs. The city has received a German-speaking visitor from Chemnitz in Saxony. Guten Tag, ich bin Herr Schreiber aus Chemnitz. Ich bin ein Ingenieur, der hier in England unterwegs ist, um ihre industriellen Pläne zu studieren. Good day, I am Mr. Schreiber from Chemnitz. I am an engineer here in England to make studies of your industrial designs and locomotive railways. We in Saxony are eager to implement this technology. Place the engineer, Herr Schreiber, near the factories and railway. Industrial Phase 6, 1850 The industrialization of our region has reached a fever pitch. Only the very oldest in the city remember the relative calm before the factories opened and the slums sprawled. As even more factories open, a new canal is constructed to connect the region southeast of the city to the river for easier transport. Unfortunately, that means another ancient forest must give way. As well, a rail bridge is constructed to connect the city's new southeastern districts to the port. 
Naturally, even more tenements rise near the newest factories. Increasingly, the city's families seek leisure and entertainment to add some elegance and flavor to their lives. And thankfully, the city council have approved the clearing of an area for a large park and garden, as well as the building of a new concert hall. In London, Her Majesty Queen Victoria and Prince Albert have opened the Great Exhibition at the Crystal Palace. The building itself and the many stalls of new inventions and gadgets seem like a glimpse into a shimmering, mechanized future. Place two new mines in the hills, a canal connecting the city's southeast to the river, a rail with a bridge connecting the city's southeast to the port, four new factories, three rows of five tenements, a jail, a cemetery, two pubs, a hospital, a public park, and a concert hall. Industrial Phase 7, 1860 The Bessemer process, named after its inventor, Sir Henry Bessemer, has unlocked the process for producing large quantities of high-grade steel. New and improved foundries are producing enough steel to revolutionize machinery, transportation and construction. Likewise, the telegraph has made the sending of urgent messages across large distances a task of hours rather than weeks. An undersea cable in the Persian Gulf has connected our cities with India, the jewel of the empire. Inspired by French and American shipbuilders, our Royal Navy has commissioned a new class of steam-powered ironclad frigates, no longer at the mercy of the winds and able to withstand enemy fire. Here in our bustling industrial city, growth continues unabated, advancing with each passing year. Place a telegraph office. Two new factories two new steel foundries, a hospital, two rows of five tenements, two pubs and a bank. At the port, add two additional warehouses, a new dockyard and a new state-of-the-art steam-powered frigate. An urgent telegraph message has been received from the Viceroy's office, Raj Bhavan in Calcutta. Kapoorthala Raya Sindhu Tarfu, Sach Raya Kaal. A British Raj Sarkar Lai, Ek Adhikar Dispatch Suneha Hai. Greetings from the princely state of Kapoorthala to the Viceroy's office in Calcutta. In light of recent troubles, we continue to recruit and organize forces, but we face challenges. Proceeding according to plans. Industrial Phase 8, 1870. It's now been a full century since James Watt's curious device opened a door which opened a thousand others. The farmers in the village are still working to feed Britain's population, but mechanized equipment now means far fewer of them are needed to do the work. 
the city's population and size have soared and show no signs of slowing. The port is busier than ever, but the age of sail is fading away as a new generation of steamships take to the sea. Great Britain's output of manufactured goods is far greater than ever, but of course the need for raw goods, many of which are sourced in the colonies, is growing by the year. In the city, now a city which never sleeps, a new generation of entrepreneurs are arranging investments and loans to create even more industrial enterprises. Some of the lads at the city dockyard have organised into a football club for the city's east end and have petitioned to have the city council authorise the building of a football pitch. Several of the nearby cities have their own football clubs now and of course we won't be outdone by them. After all, it will give the workers another thing to look forward to at the end of a busy week. Place six new factories, a bank, a school, two pubs, three rows of five tenements and a football pitch. The city has received a visit from a group of Japanese officials who recently completed a tour of the United States. Myself and the other members of the Iwakura mission have come to study as much as we can about the British Empire. We are especially eager to visit and make reports on your factories, your rail yards, your courts, your government, and your schools. We will take this knowledge back to Japan to help us build our nation into a powerful modern nation, like your Great Britain. Place the gentlemen of the Iwakura mission. You've just completed a pretty intense simulation. Congratulations on making it to the conclusion. Just look at what became of the region of Britain you brought through the process of industrialization and urbanization. You might have run out of time to add certain elements, or you might have run out of space, but you gave it your best effort. This simulation was simplified in ways, of course, but it's truly interesting to think about how many cities, first in Britain and then elsewhere, experienced such rapid and unprecedented transformation. Just think, if your city on paper was a mess, imagine the grim reality and dazzling changes witnessed by real people whose lives these events forever altered. Before you go, consider discussion or writing about the following questions concerning this simulation. Cheers!